I just feel like I'm channeling something. They were plagued by traumatic childhoods, addiction, and depression from an early age. Growing up in a small town with no real prospects, and mostly coming from broken homes. During their early years, they didn't even really know how to write music, let alone produce a chart-topping metal record, but that didn't stop them from going all out and diving headfirst into a world that seemed to reject them at every corner. Singer Jacoby Shaddix would be born into a homeless family and, as a teenager, have to watch his close friend almost lose his life. These struggles and more, however, would be transformed from desperation into rock stardom. Whilst the alternative metal scene was exploding, they were hanging around outside of Deftones, Korn and Limp Bizkit concerts, trying desperately to sell their demo tapes to anyone that would listen, because no record label would touch them. On March the 7th, 2000, their debut single Last Resort would not only take the youth of America by storm, but it would bring overnight success to four young men from Vacaville, California. This is Broken Home, the story of Papa Roach. In 1993, Jacoby Shaddix and Dave Buckner would meet on the high school football field at Vacaville High School in California. And whilst they quickly became friends and spent their time trading cassettes of their favorite artists, it seemed something deeper would help this pair bond early on. Music was just an escape for me and being a young kid with some madness in my mind. It was a great way to just go somewhere else. Early years were pretty shifty and all over the place. My family was just going through a lot of upheaval. My parents split up when I was younger. My family was really, really poor, so when I was born, my family was homeless. Broken Home wouldn't become just a song for members of Papa Roach. Some of them had lived through this. At the time, Jacoby actually played bass and Dave played drums, so they decided to start jamming together and eventually looked for other members. Jacoby's bass though was stolen. Not being able to afford another one, he simply jumped on vocals. A song like Broken Home, I experienced that as a kid. I hadn't written a song about that before in my life and I felt like I had to. I needed to get this off my chest as a young adult and came to find out so many of the people walked through the same thing. Before long, they would have a full lineup. Senior high schoolers Jacoby on vocals, Jerry Horton on guitar, Dave Buckner on drums, and a 13-year-old Tobin Esperanza on bass. And not surprisingly, their musical taste would include rock, metal, and of course, hip hop. Early on, I loved Faith No More. They were a real big one for me. Deftones were another early influence on us. We lived in this small town called Vacaville, and on the weekends we'd go to Sacramento and watch Deftones in the clubs. Jacoby was born Jacoby Dakota Shaddix on July the 28th, 1976. By the time Papa Roach had formed, Faith No More had already released four studio albums, including The Real Thing, released in 1989, a record that included From Out of Nowhere and Epic, two of the biggest singles from the alternative era. Jacoby was also a big fan of Mike Ness from Social Distortion, an American punk rock band formed in the late 70s, and Wu-Tang Clan, a now iconic American hip-hop collective that dominated hip-hop in the 90s with their debut record, Enter the Wu-Tang, released in 1993, and went on to smash the Billboard charts in 97 with Wu-Tang Forever. It seemed music was definitely an escape for Jacoby, Dave and Tobin, as all three of these members of Roach seemed to have had it pretty rough as kids. Jacoby was born into a homeless family, Tobin's parents divorced when he was just six, Dave Buckner's father, a Vietnam vet from the age of 18, left shortly after he was born and died when Buckner was just 13. 
Jerry Horton was the only member of Papa Roach that seemed to have had a stable upbringing. People think of me as a very positive person, but there's also this dark self-loathing side to myself. I have this terrible negative self-talk that I've got to keep on a leash. Tobin came from a broken home, I came from a broken home, Dave Buckner came from a broken home. He suffered some incredible losses as a young man. Guitarist Jerry Horton shared the same love for Faith No More as Jacoby and also looked up to the Red Hot Chili Peppers and Mr. Bungle. Mr. Bungle being the American experimental rock band formed in 1985 that includes Mike Patton of Faith No More. But the song that actually made Jerry pick up the guitar in the first place and Justice For All by Metallica. And three of his favorite albums were Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, Metallica, Master of Puppets, and Wu-Tang Clan, Enter the Wu-Tang. So the early days of Papa Roach were full of trauma and what many would consider to be dead-end jobs for the most part. Jacoby was scrubbing hospital toilets, Tobin stacked shelves at a retail store called McFrugal's and drummer Buckner delivered furniture. Guitarist Jerry, on the other hand, was a skilled roofer. Despite their passion for music and dreams of becoming rock stars, Papa Roach didn't seem to be off to a great start. They didn't really seem to have any career prospects and they even lost a school talent show after playing a cover of the Jimi Hendrix song, Fire. Not exactly a confidence booster for a young, aspiring band. But of course, that wouldn't stop them from infesting their local music scene. When Papa Roach formed, we were still one year away from the first new metal album being released, which is of course the self-titled 1994 album by Korn. And although Papa Roach were somewhat included within the new metal genre, it's fair to say they were more alternative metal than anything else. The band themselves wanted to be the punk version of alternative metal, which may help explain their first EP, Potatoes for Christmas, released in 1994. That was a sample of the very first Papa Roach EP, and as you can tell, it sounds nothing like, well, Papa Roach. This EP seems to be inspired by Red Hot Chili Peppers and Mr. Bungle. And it's worth noting that the very first Roach lineup, the lineup responsible for this record, was slightly different, but only for a short period of time. However, there is still a personal story behind the title, Potatoes for Christmas. When my grandfather was growing up, his family was so poor, like starving poor. On Christmas, the kids woke up and opened up a box. And what was in the box? Giant bags of potatoes. And that's what they got for Christmas. Potatoes for Christmas. And they were grateful for it. They were happy about it. Obviously, this EP didn't do much for Papa Roach and their quest for stardom. A couple of years later, however, in 1997, they would release their debut record, Old Friends from Young Years, and the emotional theme would continue. Bass player Tobin Esperanza, whose father left when he was six, would somehow end up producing this record, despite not having seen Tobin for roughly 13 years. <laughs> Old friends from young years definitely showcase something similar to the Papa Roach sound that we all came to know and love. The band was still struggling though. Not only could they not even afford a van to tour in, they had to borrow $700 from a local drug dealer to fund the pressing of the album. Not exactly the major label record deal they were looking for. I asked the local drug dealer for a $700 loan. Our first full-length independent release, Old Friends from Young Years, was funded on drug money. We weren't rich kids. We didn't have parents or benefactors throwing cash at us. We went out and got this done on the hustle 
and it made us who we are today. And without major label backing, they had no major promotion to go with it either. So they had to do things the old school way and the hard way. They had to hit the streets and physically spread the gospel of Papa Roach, trying to sell CDs outside of concerts to alternative kids or basically anyone that would simply give them the time of day. We took a page from the East Coast hip hop book. They'd roll out with the boombox and sling their stuff on the street. I respected that hustle. I was a hard worker and I grew up with the value of if you put the hard work in, you'll see the results type of mentality. We would roll up on Deftones concerts or corn concerts, Limp Biscuit concerts with a boombox on our shoulders and I rap, what the fuck, Papa Roach, five bucks. I had this chant and this mantra and people would be like, who's this weirdo? That was our social media. They actually started to build a small fan base with this method, which many bands had been doing before them for many years. They started playing small clubs and convinced someone to help them get a tour van on credit so they could spread their message even further. That someone would be Jacoby's wife, Kelly, who he married when he was just 20 years old in 1997. We had a big white van back in the day and it was a 15 passenger van. My wife actually signed the paperwork for it because none of us had good credit in the band. Kelly was the only one with credit so she graciously, against her best judgment at the time, she went and signed the paperwork for us. Whilst this may seem like a chaotic start to a band, no money, no record deal, not even credit decent enough to buy a van to tour in, it was pretty common for bands from this era and any era to struggle when first starting out. Even Metallica had to drive around in a small van, playing local shows to even smaller crowds, before they changed the course of metal music forever. These were simply the foundations that Papa Roach had to build on. They would spend the next couple of years touring as much as possible, spreading their music and their name, even landing a couple of shows with Powerman 5000 in 1997, along with Soulfly and Alien Ant Farm in 1998. And as we all know, 1998 was a huge year for new metal. System of a Down's debut album, Strictly Diesel by Spineshank and Follow the Leader by Korn, all hit the shelves. <laughs> Limp Bizkit, Slipknot and Deftones were all contributing their own brand of music to the new metal explosion also. But just around the corner, the new millennium had a surprise in store for all of us. And for Papa Roach, it really was their last resort. Rejection, rejection, and even more rejection is exactly what Papa Roach faced when trying to get a decent record deal for their next album. Although they managed to get an audience with Warner Brothers and even recorded a demo for them, they simply weren't interested. Meanwhile, bands such as Korn, Limp Bizkit and Deftones were releasing their albums via major labels such as Interscope, Epic and Maverick Records. And Papa Roach couldn't even get a deal to release one single. And their peers were selling hundreds of thousands of albums. Follow the Leader by Korn sold 268,000 units in its first week of release. Around the Fur by Deftone sold close to 50,000 copies and Limp Bizkit's second studio album, Significant Other, sold close to 1 million copies over a two-week period, climbing to number one on the Billboard 200. We got shot down by all these record companies in the process of trying to get a deal. Our expectation was, we're getting a van, we're going on tour, we're going to sell a couple of hundred thousand records, maybe creep up to gold if that's possible. Whereas we dropped the first single and it was a rocket ship ride to the top. The madness, it just began. March the 7th, 2000, Papa Roach would release their first single, Last Resort. Suffocation, no breathing, they had finally landed a record deal with DreamWorks in October of 1999. 
DreamWorks was founded by David Geffen of Geffen Records, Steven Spielberg, and the former chairman of Walt Disney Studios, so it's safe to say this was a major label deal. DreamWorks had released records for Power Man 5000, Henry Rollins Band, and even a comedy album by Chris Rock. And it was about to release the second studio album by Papa Roach, but it was Last Resort that brought them overnight success. Although the single landed the band their first Billboard chart position, it came at a high price. Last Resort was a cry for help. I'm losing it. I have lost it. I have spilt all of my marbles. Papa Roach has always been purpose-driven music, with our first single, Last Resort, talking about feelings of suicidal thoughts. Coming out of the gate with that song really brought a lot of attention to our band, and a lot of people gravitated towards it because they either could identify with it themselves or they had someone in their lives that they loved, had attempted or had those feelings or thoughts. I've been in that space multiple times in my life. Thank God I'm just a coward and can't do it. And essentially, I had a friend whose father took his life. He said to me, really, that's the most selfish act a human being can do. I really thought about that and I thought, man, that really is. But on the other hand, when you're in that space, it feels like nobody can help you. Although Last Resort was written about Jacoby's roommate at the time, it would come to resonate with thousands of teenagers across America. The lyrics, however, were so graphic for the time period that most of them were censored from the music video and the single edit version that hit the airwaves on radio stations across the nation. The video quickly became an instant classic and it received heavy rotation on MTV. And whilst it may look as if the band were told to wear black for the video to fit in with the fans, Papa Roach got the idea when listening to Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash famously only dressed in black for most of his career, and the reason why was simple. This sounds like just a record plug, and it's not. People were always asking me why I wore black. I've worn black basically ever since I've been in the music business but I never did really answer the reporters when they asked that question. I wear black for the poor and the beaten down. Living in the hopeless, hungry side of town, I wear it for the prisoner who has long paid for his crime, but is there because he's a victim of the times. And wearing black also kind of fit the ethos that Papa Roach were trying to achieve. They wanted to do things differently. They wanted to be the punk version of alternative metal. So whilst everyone else strutted around in Adidas tracksuits or a bright red New York Yankees baseball hat, Roach strangely stood out dressed all in black. Last Resort put Papa Roach on the alternative and new metal map. And just a few weeks later, they would release their breakthrough album, Infest. On April the 25th, 2000, Papa Roach released their commercial debut, Infest. Just one year later, the album is certified triple platinum on the 18th of July, 2001. Last Resort, Broken Home, Between Angels and Insects, and Dead Cell would be released as singles. The record entered at number 48 on the Billboard 200 chart and peaked at number 5. Not only did Infest make Papa Roach well-known in America almost overnight, this album went global, landing the Vacaville 4 chart positions in the UK, Germany, Canada, and even Finland. Now, instead of hanging around outside Limp Bizkit and Deftones concerts trying to get new fans, they were playing shows with them. In 2001, Papa Roach were playing festivals across America and Europe, sharing the stage with the likes of Black Sabbath and Marilyn Manson at Ozfest, and across the pond, they were hitting the road with Eminem, System of a Down, and even supporting Tool in Paris. Infest was an album that connected with people on a level that many bands from the era couldn't replicate. It just had an element of realism that reflected and resonated with the youth of America. 
The reason for this is simple. Jacoby Shaddix was speaking from his own very real and very dark past. The beauty of Last Resort is that my friend's struggle and pain sparked an emotion in me that sparked a lyric that sparked a connection through music worldwide with millions of people. Thousands of lives have been saved by this song. I meet people every day on tour that say your music saved my life. It's pretty amazing that you can take this trauma and put it into art and it becomes a beacon of hope to people. We don't want to feel alone. That's what it comes down to. A lot of times when we're in dark mental states, our heads can speak some dark stuff into our existence. Music can cut through those icy parts of your heart. You take a look at yourself and understand that struggle is part of this life. Not only did members of Papa Roach live through some incredible struggles whilst trying to create this now iconic album of the new metal millennium, they lived through it with thousands of other people that felt that very struggle in their own lives. For some, Infest was simply a connection for an outcast. For others, it was a shining light from the darkness of a broken home. Breaking through my mistakes, free fall into grace.